Hi, welcome everybody. Welcome back to the Be Healthy Summit and welcome Bernie Clark. I'm so happy to have you on. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Bernie has a degree in science and spent 30 years as a senior executive in the high-tech space industry. He embarked upon meditation in the 1970s and began teaching yoga in the 1990s. He has authored several books, The Complete Guide to Yin Yoga, From the Gita to the Grail, Your Body, Your Yoga, and Your Spine, Your Yoga. He conducts yoga teacher training several times a year in Vancouver, Canada. <laughs> How are you today, Bernie? I'm well, thank you. How are you, Stephanie? Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. Bernie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What's your story? <laughs> well, we only have an hour, so I'll give you a short version of it. Um, even as a child, I was always interested in religion and mythologies, and, but also had a keen interest in science. So when I grew up and went to university, I naturally went to the sciences and found a job in the high-tech industry where I was able to hang out with rocket scientists literally all day long. But that interest in mythology and spirituality in Eastern ways kind of stuck with me. And to help me deal with stress early in my, my business career, I took up meditation. My first introduction to meditation was in the Zen style. And that was in my early 20s. And I kept doing that until about my early 40s. But then I decided I really needed to have a Sangha, a group that I could meditate with. And the group that I chose was at a yoga center. So it was a Zen and yoga center. And the owner there kept telling me I should try the yoga as well. And I kept saying, no, I'm just here for the meditation. I saw these very flexible young women walk in and said, I'm not into yogurt. But finally, one day she said the magic words to me. She said, yoga will really help your golf game. And so I was an avid golfer that's a very zen-like sport. So I thought, okay, I'll try the yoga. And she's right. It really, really did help with my golf. But... I started to get into yoga so much, I ended up quitting golf and just doing yoga full time. So yoga actually killed my golf game. But I did find it to give me a good balance with my business world and the stress world. But with my scientific interest in kind of the Western way things work, I still had this interest, well, these experiences we have in the East, can we explain them using Western maps and models or is it completely esoteric and unknowable? So I, I kept trying to build the bridges between Eastern experience and Western understanding. And to me, that, that's a bit of a passion. Yeah, for sure. One can tell by reading your books. <laughs> <laughs> so did you start out with an active form of yoga or did you get right into yin yoga? No, my first introduction, the teacher that I started with, she came through the Shivananda tradition. So it wasn't quite the precision of a Yangar and it wasn't the sweatiness of vinyasa, not yet. This was in the mid 90s, I guess. But after a couple of years, I discovered Ashtanga, and through that, variations like power yoga with Shiva Ray, and I really loved that sweaty type A type practice. And so I fell in love with Ashtanga, and for many years I was doing the Mysore practice every day. So I kind of got away from the, the basic Hatha. But around 2002, 2003, I came across Sarah Powers and through Sarah Paul Grilly, and I realized I really needed this other part, the yin part, to balance all the type A yang stuff I've been doing. Because at that point, I'd hit my 50s, and although I loved the shtanga, it no longer loved me. It kind of said, hey, 50 now, we're done with you. you. You can't do this anymore. And so thankfully, that was the time I, I came across yin yoga, and that really helped to balance, and that's what my body needed at that time. And so from then on, it was a bit of both not so much the dynamic, uh, full Ashtanga practice, but parts of vinyasa flow, and then half the practice being yin yoga. Hmm. All right. And now you've become a well-known expert on yin yoga and always ready to answer questions for all the things that come up on the yin yoga forum. Yeah, and I was happy to pay it forward because I got so much from Paul and Sarah and other people. So this isn't something you can keep to yourself, so you share it out there. Yeah, the world is so grateful for you doing that. <laughs> um, one thing you always discuss is the, um, the point of um, anti-fragility and uh, the necessity to stress our joints. Can you please speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think stress has a bit of a, a bad rap in our culture. <clears throat> and it's probably because we're, we're overstressed. You definitely can't have too much stress. But there's really two types of stress that 
can happen in life. One is the stress of overdoing. We can say, we can call that distress. But there's also healthy stress. We call that eustress. So think of that in the story of Goldilocks and the boucle d'or, the girl with the golden hair. And she went into the forest and came across the house of the three bears. And one bear's porridge was too hot. One bear's porridge was too cold. She wanted the bear's porridge that was just right, just in the middle. And the same with the beds and the chairs. She always wanted to find the median. And that's what we need with stress too. If we have no stress, the body will atrophy. If we have too much stress, the body will degenerate. Well, I came across this term anti-fragility from the writings of a, actually a, a financial analyst named Nassim Talib. And he talked about how in the 2008 financial crisis, the banks had gotten too big and became fragile. It was not a good idea to make them so big and so fragile. But he said, living things, we're anti-fragile. We need a certain amount of stress in order to be healthy. No stress, no health. Too much stress, we break. But as we stress, we become stronger and healthier. Machines don't do that. Machines wear out. Like eventually your computer, your car, it's going to break down. You keep stressing it, it gets weaker and weaker. But with the living organisms, as we stress the organism, every time we stress and then rest, the organism becomes stronger. And so we have this, the whole theory of exercise is to stress a little bit, rest. Stress and then rest stress and then rest. And each time we do that, the tissues become more resilient, more stronger. So we need stress, stress is not bad. Yeah, you can go too far and you go over the cliff. Now, there's an edge there, we don't wanna go past the edge. But we also don't do nothing either. And a lot of therapists, doctors and yoga teachers, they make this binary. They think, well, because someone's got a bad back or they got osteoporosis or they have an injury, they shouldn't do anything. They should just let it completely rest. Well, that's a, rep- a recipe for atrophy. You need to stress. But if you have an injury, you have to be careful because you can easily go too far. When you're healthy, the distance between not much and too far is quite, quite broad. But when you're injured, that distance is much smaller. But you still need some stress. Yes, you can overdo it. So be careful, pay attention. As you get healthier, you can go further and further. But to say never do anything, that's not healthy either. So we always need to balance this, stress and rest. You need both. For sure. But in my experience, it's kind of hard to explain to a beginner um, how to find the edge. What do you, what do, you do? How do you? How do you explain to a beginning student? Well, I think that's one of the biggest gifts as teachers that we can give our students is to learn how to pay attention. Often when I come up to a student, I'll ask them, what are they feeling? I'll see them in the pose and they're kind of struggling. They don't look comfortable in the pose. So rather than do a physical adjustment to them, which is what I used to do early in my career, that's the time is all about putting people in the poses in positions. I've learned that that's an aesthetic. You know, why do I want them to look that way? So instead today I'll ask, what are you feeling? What is your experience? And most beginning students, as you say, they have no idea. So they'll look up at me sweetly and say, fine. And I say, well, I'm glad you're feeling fine. That's not what I asked you. I asked, what are you feeling, not how are you feeling? And they won't know. They'll kind of look off in space. So I'll have to be a bit more directive. I'll have to teach them how to pay attention to the body. For instance, if they're in a butterfly pose. Well, there's a couple of targeted areas for a butterfly pose. You put somebody in a butterfly, they fold forward. You'd like to create a stress along the back of the spine or maybe through the inner legs. So I'll ask them, are you feeling anything along the spine? And they'll look off from the distance and say, yeah. Okay, now they're starting to look inside, but they still don't have it yet. So I'll have to guide them. Is the feeling in one spot or is it spread out? Is it superficial on the surface or is it deep? Does it throb, does it come and go, or is it constant? And now they're starting to learn how to attend to themselves. Is it sharp, is it dull, is it achy? Is it hot, is it cold? So over time, as a teacher, you can start to teach the students how to become aware of what's happening in their body. So they'll get to decide, this pose is too deep, I'm too close to the edge, or I'm not feeling anything, I need to go a bit deeper. I can't tell that by looking. And for me just to say, oh, just come forward, that may be inappropriate, maybe they're already at the edge. I don't know, but maybe I can help them learn that and then they can start to, I call it, fly their own plane. 
Yeah, exactly. I love that approach. I, it was exactly the same for me. I always used to assist my students a lot, but the more I learned about the individual, individual anatomy, the more I let go of that and just help the students to realize themselves what they're feeling. So I really love what you're saying there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, ideally, the teacher shouldn't put themselves out of a job. <laughs> Eventually, the student will be able to figure this all out for themselves. Yeah. And one important thing in yin yoga is also to stress um, the fascia. Can you please explain to us what fascia is and why it is so important to keep <clears throat> it healthy? Yeah, fascia, like any other tissue, needs exercise to be healthy. But what fascia is, and there's, there's so many different ways of describing it. Um, my shorthand way is to say it's a, a collection of stiff and elastic fibers in water-filled bubble wrap that invests and develops the whole body. It's ubiquitous. It's like a three-dimensional body stocking that we have inside. So it's kind of everywhere. And it kind of takes on the shape of a spider web. Not the two-dimensional spider webs you really love to see, but most spider webs are like nests. And the spider threads are in a three-dimensional array. Well, that's the fashion side of us as well. We've got strings of collagen and elastin that gives us resilient and stretchiness, but it goes everywhere. And inside this, this three-dimensional body stocking, you get little bubbles, and inside a bubble, a muscle cell may grow, and that'll become a muscle embedded in the fascia. Over here, you may get some cartilage that's going to grow. Over here, you might get some calcium um, hydroxyapatite put down, and now you're going to have bone. So inside the fascia, we have all these other tissues growing. Nerves will go through the fascia. Blood vessels will go through the fascia. But it all starts with the fascia. It's an interconnecting, intercommunicating system. So we need to work that just as we need to work any other tissues. We, we know the muscles love to get stressed, and we get stronger by exercising the muscles. Well, the same with the fascia. It's, it's alive, it reacts to the stresses. And we know that there are stem cells that kind of live in the, the spider web. And depending on how much stress you put in these stem cells, they will transfer, transform into different types of cells. Like if there's very little stress, they may say, well, we're in a very easy environment, I'm gonna become a neuron, and it'll become a nerve cell. Put a little bit more stress, it may say, okay, I'm gonna become a muscle cell. Put even more stress, it may say, I'm gonna become a cartilage cell. Put even more stress, it'll say, I'm gonna become a bone cell. So these stem cells are listening to how much stress the body's putting into the tissues. If we put no stress, these cells won't know what to differentiate into. So we need to stress these tissues, all tissues, including the fascia. And how do we stress the fascia? What's the best way? Well, there's not one type of fascia. <laughs> it used to be, you know, 15, 20 years ago, fascia was a kind of a catch-all category. We had a concept called connective tissues, and that included bones, blood is a connective tissue, tendons and ligaments, and then everything else was fascia. Well, today we know that ligaments, tendons, joint capsules, they're all fascia. They're all part of this fascial tissue. And even our muscles, they become fascia. 30% of what we call muscle is fascial bags and, and tubes within the muscles. And even today, there are some scientists who claim bone is fascia. John Sarkey at the University of Dundee, he likes to say, well, you know, the collagen goes everywhere. And since inside this collagen, we have cartilage, and inside this, we have bone, and inside this, we have muscle, it's all fascia. So he'd like to say that even bone is fascia. So how we stress bone is different than how we stress muscle, which is different than how we stress a ligament. They all need sort of stress. Bones react very well to compressive stress. Like when you walk, your bones are hitting into each other. When you're doing a deep back bend, the spinous processes and the set joints in the spine, they're pressing into each other. And that can be healthy. Over time, that's gonna stimulate the osteoblast in there to build more bone. If you stress the muscles, they're gonna they respond usually to tension. They get pulled apart or they contract and they can resist that pulling apart. And so through tension, the muscles get stronger. Through the bones, compression, they get stronger. Now in terms of our fascia and our ligaments and our tendons, they too react to tension. As you stress the fascia, <clears throat> they have cells that are embedded in there like spiders living in the spider web. They're called um, fibroblasts they sense the stress. And if there's enough stress for enough time, 
they'll turn on and they'll start to lay down more, more collagen. Or they may lay down more water lugging molecules. It's another part of fascia is the little microvacuoles of water. It's like bubble wrap. But instead of air being in the bubble wrap, it's water in there. Well, this water is also kind of produced by the fascia. So it's only by stimulating the fascia, by stressing it, that we turn it on so it'll grow more, it'll become thicker, stronger, and maybe even over time, longer. So we tend, as we get older, to shrink wrap. We kind of dry up, dry up, we curl up, we lose our range of motion. But as we exercise our fascia, we keep that range of motion. The fascia will produce more collagen and, and keep us broad, open. The joints can be thicker and stronger and more open, so we maintain our range of motion. Mm. So how does fascial tissue differ from muscular, muscular tissue? What's the difference then? <clears throat> well, the muscle grows inside the fascia. Um, one map of the body, we can say we're tubes within tubes within tubes, or we're bags within bags within bags. And all these bags, all these tubes are fascia. So inside this tube, you might have a few muscle cells, and inside that will grow the muscles. So we have an outer tube of fascia called the epimysium, and then we have individual tubes. Well, and that's wrapped with fascia called paramysium, and then inside the muscle, wrapping the muscle cell itself, there's another tube of fascia called the endomysium, but this fascia actually goes inside the muscle cell. So the fascia connects all the different parts of the muscle to other muscles, and so we have tubes of muscles. If you think of, say, your thigh, right at the top of your thigh, we've got the quadricep groups. There's four muscles in there. They all have their bag. If you look at a cross-section, there's some laboratories that have done this, that take a cross-section through the thigh, and you'll see there's a, a septum of fascia that comes out from the femur, and it envelops all four of the quadricep muscles. They're all inside that bag. But if you look at the top, there's your rectus femoris muscle. It has its own bag. And here's your vastus medialis, the vastus lateralis. And so all these muscles have their own bag. And if you go even more under a microscope, you'll see the individual muscle fibers have their bags. And these bags of fascia, they're lubricated. They allow each muscle fiber to glide independently. So when you contract your quadriceps, you don't contract your hamstrings too. There's a fascial membrane in there with some liquid, some water lubricant. So all these fascial bags can contract and release independently. Mm, thank Quite you. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and science taught us that a lot of our pain actually comes from the fascia. Can you please speak to that, why that is? Yeah, I heard about this from Dr. Robert Sleip at the University of Ulm, a very famous rock star in fascia research. Uh, he reports that fascia has 10 times more nerve endings than muscles do. And we know fascia has a lot of different types of nerve endings. Fascia can sense pressure. It can sense the pH, the acidity level of our tissues. But it can also sense pressure and pain. There are nociceptors, free nerve endings. And the muscles themselves don't really give us too many signals of pain. A lot of people have lower back pain. We used to think that came from maybe a bulging disc. Now we realize most people have a bulging disc, they don't have back pain. Then we thought it's the back muscles they're complaining. Now with other works like Carlos Deco and Helen Langevin, they're finding out that the pain actually arises in the fascia. The muscles may get inflamed and that's gonna push against the fascia and it's the fascia that reacts and says, oh, something's wrong with my friend here, we better attend to this. So it's the fascia, as I say, there's 10 times more nerve endings in the fascia that create the pain signals. And I think it was Helen Langevin's work that discovered that people with low back pain, their fascia in the lower back is twice as thick as people who don't have back pain. Now, we're not sure if the back pain causes the fascia to be thicker or the thicker fascia causes the pain. There's just a correlation there. We're not quite sure what the causation is. But definitely, the fascia is very sensitive. Yeah, for sure. And um, did you also make the experience that yin yoga can help a lot of people, especially with back pain? Well, Helen Langevin, again, uh, another rock star in fashion, she did a fabulous experiment once. She had um, a number of subjects, and she injected just saline water, salt water, into their lower backs, into the lumbar dorsal fascia, and that created an inflammation. And then for half the subjects, she did 10 minutes of yoga twice a day too, a full body stretch. And the other part were the control groups. There was no yoga done. And the people that had the yoga, just 10 minutes a day, twice a day, they resolved that inflammation very quickly with very little pain compared to the control groups. Now, the subjects were actually rats. They weren't people. 
and she was injecting the saline into the backs of these rats. And then she'd pick up their tails at the edge of a table. They would, with their little paws, they'd grab the edge of the table. And they, she said they really enjoyed the stretch. They didn't enjoy it, they'd let go. But they seemed to really like this. For 10 minutes, she was doing a full body, like a, a down dog to these rats. And that chronic stress helped to resolve the inflammation. Now, she didn't use the term yin yoga, but when I read about her experiments, I thought, well, that's yin. That's a long-held static stress, 10 minutes, passive, and that resolved the inflammation. So we know that the fascia is sensitive. We have these nerves that feel stresses, and they, through Helen Langevin's work, they have an effect on the fibroblast. If you just stress a fibroblast, fibroblast quickly and release it, it won't react. But if you put the stress in there and let it hold for time, then it starts to turn on, and it can create more fascia, it can dissolve away fascia that shouldn't be there, uh, these fibroblasts can produce enzymes that dissolve away scar tissue, for instance. And she came at this actually originally from acupuncture research, where you put a needle in and then you leave it there for a while. You don't just put the needle in and come out again. So you leave it there for like 20 minutes. Well, again, that's kind of yin. It's a long-held static stress. Of course, an acupuncturist, when they put the needle in, they just don't put it in. They twist it and they wiggle it. And the collagen gets caught up on the needle and when you turn the needle, it starts to pull the collagen, which creates a mechanical stress in the tissues. Now, in yin yoga, we don't hold a pose for 20 minutes, but if you're doing, say, butterfly, that's a forward flexion, you might stay there for 10 minutes, and then you do caterpillar, like a Paschimottanasa, that may be another five minutes, and you might do straddle fold. So over the period of 20 minutes, you may have done a, a lot of stress to the lumbar dorsal fascia, which is lower back. And again, she didn't call it yin, but that's kind of what we're doing. Yeah, exactly. I have the same experience from my students and also from myself. I was very much into martial arts and um, I was a chronic uh, back pain. Um, I, I always had back pain after that and um, I couldn't find a solution to get rid of it. And once I started to do yin yoga, it got so much better. It was incredible. I'm totally free of back pain now, even though I'm much older now than I yeah. used to be when I did the martial arts. So it does have, have an effect for sure. Well, Helen Langevin has also done work, or her lab's done work with uh, cancer cells. They injected breast cancer cells into mice. And they, again, just did uh, a one 10-minute session a day of this full body stretching. And the mice that had the stretching, their tumor cell growth actually reduced, whereas the control groups, they increased by about 42% over, I think it was a four-week period. So we're not saying yin yoga will cure cancer, but again, the fascia seems to respond in a very healthy way, even to the point where it reduced the cancer cells. So there's a lot of advantages that we know of to stressing the fascia in this long-held stratic way. Yeah, that's an amazing result. I, I just wonder what would have happened if they had done it even longer than just four weeks. Yeah. 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 It's a little bit risky to do on humans because we just don't know if the long-term effect would make it worse or better, but it's highly indicative that on mice, at least, these long-held static stresses are very healthy for them. Yeah. We have the anecdotal evidence. You have it, I have it, all our students. Even if we can't explain scientifically how it works or why it works, the fact is it works. And I often say with my association with scientists that as scientists, we love our maps. We like to put the whole world into a theory. And we test the theory. That's part of the scientific process. You, you have a piece of data, some result, and you see if you can come up with a hypothesis or some map that explains it, and then you test it. But sometimes we come up with a result that doesn't fit our map. It's kind of analogous to, say you're in a big city, you've never been there before, and you're looking for a coffee shop, a Starbucks, and you look on your cell phone, and Google Maps says, well, there's none around, you have to go 10 blocks away. But you look up, and there in front of you is a Starbucks. But it's not on your map, but there it is. Now, a lot of scientists will say, well, that Starbucks is not real. That's an experimental error. It's an outlier. Let's forget that. No, a real science is to figure out, well, how do I change my map to account for that Starbucks? Now, in our case, we have hundreds of students. And if you sum up all the yoga, yin yoga teachers around the world, we have hundreds of thousands of students who have been doing yin yoga now for decades, and they find it works, like you with your background. We know it works. Now, it's up to us to figure out the science behind that. Whereas I think a lot of times students say, 
well, I don't know if this is working for me because I don't understand the science, so maybe I shouldn't do this. That's backwards. If it's working for you, it's working for you. You don't have to deny your own experience. Even if we can't explain it, it still worked for you. Now the fun is, can we explain it? Okay, but just because we can't, or we can't explain it well, doesn't mean what you experienced was invalid. It was your experience. So we start with that first. Start with the data, and then you have to come up with the science to explain the data. Yeah, exactly. And from my opinion, I could finally balance yin and yang, because when I did all the martial arts, I did mm -hmm. some excessive training, and it was I was just too much in my yang energy and my yin was depleted. And right. when I balanced it out, I felt awesome. I had no more pain, but an excess yeah. is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, similar to my experience with the Ashtanga, uh, which is very yang, and I was burning out, becoming depleted, and adding the yin gave me back my balance. And I think the older we get, the more we need yin, because the older we get, we more and more yin-like. Paul Gulley has this saying that we follow this arc of aging, we start life as a young baby, completely young. A baby is full, fully mobile. There's no stability there. You have to be very careful holding the head of a baby because the neck's not strong enough to hold it. But over time, as soon as from we're born, we become more yin-like. And somewhere in our maybe mid-20s, we're kind of in that balance. And if we just stayed there, it would be okay. But we keep getting more and more yin-like until we finish life in rigor mortis. We can't move at all, completely stiff. So in the early part of our life, we're in the yang phase, we need yang exercise, we need to develop stability, we need to work on our muscles and strength. But in the later part of life, we're already very stable, we need to work on mobility, and yin yoga will give us mobility more quickly than yang yoga will. So the older I get, the more I have to rely on my yin practice to maintain my mobility, my range of motion. Yeah, it's such a beautiful practice, just a gift, I think, <laughs> every yeah. day. Yeah. So, Bernie, what do you think happens when our fascia gets stuck, when we get cross-links? What happens physically and energetically? Well, cross-links are, like imagine a ladder. A ladder, you have the two legs, and then you've got rungs. If you had a ladder with only one rung, it'd be a very unstable ladder. And so we put a lot of rungs in there. You might have 12 rungs. Now the ladder is very stable. You can easily climb up and down. it. We need these cross-links. They give rigidity and support to the body. But if you have too many, then the tissues can't move. And in some places we want that. For instance, the discs between our vertebrae, they have a lot of crosslinks in the fascia forming the discs because you don't want the discs bulging out all the time. So there's a lot of stiffness and support there. In your ears, there's no crosslinks. There's a lot of elastin there. We don't really need a lot of support here. So depending on where the tissue is, we have more or less. Now with scar tissue, we just get all crosslinked all up. There's just too many linkages here. It's just like a, a matted, ball of yarn and that's not healthy tissue tissue normally has an alignment to the, the collagen usually in the predominant direction if i'm playing tennis and i serve a lot the collagen in my shoulder would tend to line up in this direction the collagen that goes in the other directions because i'm not stressing them the fibroblasts will sense that and they'll dissolve away those ones and so what's left is just the collagen this way and as i'm continually doing this that collagen will get thicker and stronger and there may be cross links in between there but if I have an injury or an operation, maybe I have an appendix taken out, now the scar tissue forms, and it's being formed in all three dimensions. These fibroblasts, they don't know which way is up. They're just putting it all down there. And that's good for the initial injury. But the body should take that away afterwards. When we complete the healing, that's supposed to be dissolved away. But sometimes the body stops too soon. It says, you know, that's good enough. We're okay now. And the scar is still left there. So now we've got this fascia that's all intertwined and cross-linked. And that's not very good. You can start to reabsorb that through light type stresses. Again, this is something that Robert Slipe has talked about. Foam rolling and stresses like that can actually start to change the water nature underneath the fascia. You're not going to pull the scar apart. That would take quite a bit of force, and that could be quite painful. That's something you may do in physiotherapy. But through our yin practice and through foam rolling, you might just change enough so that the immune system goes in and finishes the job and starts to dissolve away the, the collagen and the crosslinks that were there. So through time and through, there's other therapies like prolotherapy where they inject, again, salt water into the scar tissue, and that creates a, an inflammation, a temporary inflammation, which causes the body to say, hey, we're injured, let's go and fix this. So the immune system's attracted there and starts to dissolve the, the scar tissue away again. 
So crosslinks, they can be good, they can be bad. Where we need them, we want them. Where we don't need them, we kind of want to get rid of them. Yeah, I also use cupping to get rid of my adhesions and for my own scars, that's also um, really effective. Yeah, um, Joe Fee and yourself, the people with a background in traditional Chinese medicine, I can see pictures of them with these cup marks all over their back. It looks like when somebody's been beating on them, they got these welts, but it's very effective practice. My own doctor does that for me once in a while, not as often as I'd like maybe, but yeah. Yeah, and you, it's, can, it's you, can it. yeah you can even do it yourself. You don't even have to go to the doctor. Dude, there's some spots in my upper back that I find hard to get myself. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask somebody to do it. <laughs> and also you just don't have to leave them on all the time. You can also make like a gliding movement and um, that keeps the fascia really supple. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Bernie, we also talk and you know a lot about individual um, anatomy and how everyone's different and how we have to adapt the practice. Can you please speak to that? Yeah, there's a little story I like to tell sometimes. Imagine you're going to your doctor and you've got a really bad headache and you get into your doctor's office and maybe she's running a little bit late. There's 19 other patients waiting for her. So finally she comes in and looks around the room and says, okay, today we're all doing aspirin. Aspirin, 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 aspirin. And you're thinking, oh good, I got a headache, I really could use that. But sitting beside you is a woman who's six months pregnant. And she says, wait a minute, is aspirin gonna be good for my baby? Beside her is someone with asthma. And she's thinking, aspirin's not gonna help me at all. Beside her is someone with an ulcer. Aspirin's gonna kill my stomach, I don't wanna do aspirin. And the doctor just says, no, no, we're all doing aspirin. Aspirin, aspirin, aspirin. Now you wouldn't go back to that doctor because you want the doctor to sit with you and figure out what's working for you. What do you need? But now you come to your yoga studio and you go in there and there's 19 other students. And here comes a teacher and she says, okay, today we're all doing sun salutations. And you may have thought, oh, I just did a week of yin yoga. I really need to move. That's going to be great. But beside you is a woman who's six months pregnant. She's thinking, is the up dog going to be good for my baby in sun salutations? Somebody else has got carpal tunnel syndrome. It's going to kill my wrist. And she just says, no, we're all doing sun salutes. Now, you wouldn't go back to that doctor because you want the doctor to work with you as an individual. But now we're in the yoga room with 20 individuals. What's the yoga teacher going to do? Well, we can't have 20 private classes. But if she can teach you how to listen to your body and do your own yoga because you're different than the other 19 students, then she's on the way to kind of customizing, making it a bespoke yoga practice for you. Because we're all different. Aspirin doesn't work for everybody. Up dog doesn't work for everybody. And we know this on the outside. We look around. Our faces all look different. We have different cheeks, different noses. But for some reason, we think on the inside, we're exactly the same in that everyone looks just like that picture in the anatomy book. We all have the exact same humerus and femurs and hip sockets, but we don't. We're just as individual on the inside as on the outside. So what works for one student is not gonna work for another student. It may work for most students, but it's not gonna work for everybody. And if the teacher goes into the class with the mindset that there's one right way to do a pose, like the, in lunge, the knee must be right over the, the ankle and point over the second toe, not the third toe, okay, right over the second toe, and the back foot must be turned in 45 degrees, not 70 degrees, and we try to get the heel lined up with the arch, and we get everyone precisely aligned like that, well, that's ignoring all the human variations in the shape of the bones, and why some people have to have this front foot turned out, and the back foot maybe turned in more, and the hips will never be square for this person because of where the hip sockets are located. If we're ignorant about the range of human variation, we're going to put people into poses that are inappropriate for them. So a better way, again, is to teach the student how to figure out what is the alignment for her, what works for her body. Yeah, exactly. And for me, it was such a relief um, when I did Paul's um, teacher training because the teacher trainings I did before were also very alignment orientated and oftentimes yeah. it just didn't feel right for me. And yeah. I was with Paul and learned I am actually um, the one who decides how I take the pose. That was just so wonderful for my practice. It rocked my yoga world, really. <laughs> yeah. It's easier to teach if we have a standardized alignment cues. If you can just say, okay, the knee over the ankle, knee pointing to the second toe, that's easy. We can teach everyone to do that, and we can get everyone into that shape. It's harder to teach them how to figure out what's the right alignment for you, because now I've got 20 students here. But it's actually not that difficult if you let the students experiment. 
Like, where should the feet be in mountain pose? I don't know. You know, this thing that the feet must be together, that's an aesthetic. Some people, the feet can be together. Some people, the feet have to be apart. But if we can experiment and have the students figure that out, I'll do this in down dog often. I'll have everyone come into down dog. And I'll say, okay, have your feet parallel, hip width apart. Notice how that feels. Now try the feet wider apart, turning inwards. How does that feel? A lot of people hate that. Now bring the feet together, but turn the toes out, like a V-shape. How does that feel? And for some people, the first time in their life, their heel's on the ground. So we had three variations. Which one worked better for you? So from now on, every time we come into down dog, you decide where your feet are going to be today. Now I don't have to say it anymore. I don't have to say, okay, come down dog, feet together, or feet parallel. They know what it is, and we can do the same with the hands. Where should the hands be? I don't know. But once you've done it once or twice with the students, they know what their down dog looks like. And now as a teacher, it's actually easier because I don't have to tell everyone. And I don't have to go and correct them. <laughs> like, okay, everyone hands, no, their hands are going to be here. No, you're going to be here. I don't know where they have to be. Once they figure it out, they know where it is. Yeah, for sure. And I love what you said about the doctor's office and the aspirin. That's such a good example. And I also heard you talk about the difference between a doctor and a pilot. Could you please repeat that for us? Yeah, that's a story I got from a wonderful man named Bruce Lipton, who wrote a book called The Biology of Belief. I was in a, a seven-day retreat with him once, and he asked rhetorically, what is the difference between a doctor and an airplane pilot? Now, I immediately thought about 50 things that are different, but before I can answer, he said, you know, by law, a pilot, before she fires up the airplane and taxis away from the, the terminal, there's a whole checklist of things she has to go through. Like, there's hundreds of things she's got to check out. It used to be on a book and now it's on an iPad or something. Well, a doctor as well, according to the American Medical Association and Canadian Medical Association, there's also a checklist of things that she should do when you come to see her. But you only have 10 minutes with your doctor. She doesn't have time for all that. The real difference between a pilot and a doctor is the pilot is on the plane with you. I have to pause there for a moment. The pilot's on the plane. It's in her best interest to go through this whole checklist of things because the plane crashes, she's going to die. The doctor is not on the plane with you. This doesn't mean that the doctor doesn't care. Now, maybe I've been lucky, but every doctor I've ever had in my, in my life, I really felt was looking after my best interest. But he or she was not on the plane with me. I'm the one flying the plane. Now, doctors clearly know more about health and anatomy than I do. But they're like ground control. They're on the ground. I'm in the plane. And I should listen to what they're telling me because they know more than me. But I have to take ultimate responsibility. Because if the plane crashes, they're not going to suffer. I'm the one who's going to go down. So I have to learn how to fly the plane. And I think as yoga teachers, the best thing we can do is to teach our students how to fly. Give them flying lessons. Don't just tell them what to do, because that's not going to help them learn anything. Tell them why we're doing what we're doing. Have an intention, teach them to pay attention so that they can fly the plane. So your doctor, your lawyer, your accountant, your yoga teacher, None of these people are on the plane with you. You're flying the plane. I'm sure you have the same thing, Stephanie, but I'll often get a student come up to me at the beginning of class saying, oh, I've got osteoporosis. Uh, I don't think yoga will be good for me. Tell me what to do. And I'll say, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I, know, I know nothing about you. No, yoga class is not a therapy session. If it was, I would want to know a lot more about you. I'd want to spend half an hour getting your history, your biology, your biography, I want to know what's caused it, how much is your osteoporosis, what your doctor said, what did your physio say. We'd have to do all this. And even then, I wouldn't really know, but maybe I could teach you how to, to adapt the practice to that. Early, when I first started teaching yoga, my ego got in the way, and I would think, oh, I know what this person should do. So I'd start to give a whole bunch of advice, which was all wildly inappropriate. Today, I know enough to know that I don't know enough. So I would just say, first of all, if someone comes up and says, I got osteoporosis, what should I do? My first question is, what does your doctor say? Oh, doctors know anything. Well, <laughs> they know more than I do. So I would suggest if you really have osteoporosis, you go get a professional to check it out and have a one-on-one -on -one session, maybe with a yoga therapist. But if you're going to come into this class, I don't know what you should do. Let's start easy, and we'll test a few things, try it out, see how you feel while you're in the pose, when you're coming out of the pose, and over the next day or two. These are the three times you should check because sometimes you, you do something that's too much. You don't notice it right away. It's the next day you feel, oh, what did I do? So you have to be cautious. You have to pay attention. So you experiment a little bit. 
but I don't know what they're supposed to do. That's, they've got to learn to fly their plane. Yeah, for sure. I also call it um, to get in touch with their inner yoga teacher. And mm -hmm. um, that inner yoga teacher always has priority to what um, a yoga teacher um, in front of the class says, because right. they're not in the body. They don't know what they feel. So it's so important to just feel what is happening there inside of me and to pay respect to your body and treat it lovingly. So important. Yeah. And as you said at the beginning, a lot of students don't know how to do that. We're trained not to feel. As soon as we get some sort of weird sensation, we'll take a pill, take an Advil, an ibuprofen, so I don't feel that. It's like the first car I ever had was a 1958 Volkswagen. It was pretty old even when I got it. And it worked okay, except there was one thing that really bugged me, which is a little red engine light. It kept coming on. So eventually I solved it by putting masking tape over the light. And then it was fine until it broke down on the highway. So that's what we do. We, we get these signals from our body, but we ignore them. We hide them. And now we come to yoga class and the teacher's asking you actually to pay attention to it. Most students don't know how to do that. So again, as the teacher, you have to guide them. What are you feeling? And so you have to be specific. Where? What is it? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it burning? And over time, they'll say, yeah, that did feel like maybe I shouldn't have done that. Or no, this feels good. Maybe I can go further. Now they're making the decision. They're flying the plane. Yeah, exactly. Can you please speak to breath work? How important is the breath in our practice and in our everyday life? <laughs> well, all the ancient high cultures, the word for breath was also the word for life. It's a very obvious correlation. If somebody's not breathing, they're not alive. Um, in, in Latin, the word for breath is spiritus. In Greek, is pneuma. Pneuma is air. Pneuma is, is your soul. And in India, prana. Prana is your life force, it's also your breath. So very important, if you don't have breath, you don't have life. In yin yoga, yin is a very allowing practice. So I don't really guide the breath too much in yin yoga. I let it be whatever it wants to be. But I will sneak a little bit in, because sometimes we'll do maybe something at the beginning, something Paul Gilly calls a three-part Taoist breath, just simply bring the arms up, inhaling, and as you exhale, hands push out to the side. The next inhale, bring the fingertips to the shoulders. And as you exhale, push the hands forward, round your back, drop your chin down. Inhale, reach your arms up. As you exhale, fold down into child's pose. So it was three movements, each with the breath. Do that four times. Now, without telling the class, each breath is about four seconds. Inhale, pause, four seconds. Exhale, pause. That's a 10-second breath. So we're breathing about six times a minute for two minutes. Well, there's been studies done for instance, by Professor Luciano Bernardi at the University of Pavia in Italy. He's found if you do that slow breath, just for a couple of minutes, you turn off your stress system. The sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight system, which is always on in our modern culture, which creates a lot of chronic stress, which can lead to a lot of chronic inflammation. If you just do that breath work for a couple of minutes, you turn that off and you turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest system. Now, the nice thing about turning on a switch. Like if I turn on a light switch, once it's on, I don't have to turn it on again. It's already on. So once I turn on the parasympathetic the nervous system, it's on. I don't have to keep doing this breath work for the whole class. So even though I won't call it pranayama, we'll do a, a couple of minutes of just slowing the breath down, or I might guide them through something called the ocean breath, which is just ujjayi, but with a more poetic term to it. Just breathe in, two, three, four, pause, Breathe out, two, three, four, pause. I'll guide that for six cycles. Then I'll ask them to do it themselves quietly for another six cycles. That's two minutes. And again, the sympathetic nervous system is turned off. The parasympathetic system is turned on. There's breath work. It helps to balance the, the yang with the in nature. On the other hand, you've got the more yang type of pranayamas, the bastrikas and, and kapalabhati. These I don't teach. And these I think should be taught in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a teacher because you are playing with blood chemistry here. There are warnings in the, in the ancient yoga books like the Hatha Yoga, Pratipika and others that doing this pranayama should be done very slowly. It's like taming a lion. It takes years to tame the lion. Don't try it all at once because you can get injured. 
from a Western perspective, the injuries happen because when you start to do that fast breathing, you're getting rid of carbon dioxide, you're hyperventilating. Now our blood has a slightly alkaline level. It's like our, the oceans, they're slightly alkaline. They're about 7.4 on the pH scale. If you breathe off a lot of carbon dioxide, the alkalinity will go up to about 7.6 or 7.7, .7, and that will affect the brain's function. You can have psychotic episodes. I think a lot of times people love chirtan and bhakti type things where they're chanting and dancing a lot. It's because they're hyperventilating, and that's affecting the brain and it's like they're on some sort of drugs. Well, they are affecting the brain in the same way a drug does. Now they have these altered senses. But if you do that too much, you know, without proper kind of counter poses, you can permanently damage the brain. So this, this fast breathing should always be accompanied by a kambaka, a hold. And during the hold, the carbon dioxide level builds back up again. So the blood levels go back to the normal pH. So the breath work is, you gotta, do it with somebody that really knows what they're doing so they can watch you and make sure you're not inadvertently hurting yourself. But the simple little yin type of stuff like analoma valoma, alternate nostril or just slow breath for a couple of minutes, that's pretty good. That's a good way to turn on the yin system, turn off the, the stress system. Yeah, beautifully explained. Thank you. <laughs> and what about meditation? You said you started with meditation. What can meditation do for us? Well, meditation is also another channel into turning off the stress system and turning on the rest and digest system. But beyond the physiological effects, and there's so many studies coming out now about the, the great physiological benefits of just being quiet, being meditative for 20 minutes every day. But you also get this psychological effect, a way of looking at life. My original uh, meditation practice was Zen meditation, as I mentioned. But that's a pretty fierce style of meditation. It's using the mind to stop the mind. And that's tough. If you ever tried for one minute not to have a thought, don't think about anything. Don't even think about not thinking. That's hard to do. But I, I kind of gradually over the years moved into more of a Zen light through the teachings of someone named Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh is a, a Vietnamese Zen master who got kicked out of Vietnam during the Vietnam War and set up an ashram or a monastery in the south of France called Plum Village. He was also a Zen master, but in, Zen is only called Zen in Japan. In other places, they have different names for it. In China, it's Chan. In Korea, it's San. So he was a Chan master, basically Zen master. But his is Zen light. It's not so much the fierce practice of 45 minutes twice a day of Zen meditation, but rather the practice of mindfulness, just being aware. He says mindfulness is the state of being awake and aware to the present moment, is of being at one with those around us. It's doing pretty much what you always do, except you do it with awareness of what you're doing. If you're eating, sitting, talking, working, walking, you're aware that you're eating, sitting, talking, working, walking. And so my meditation practice over the decades has really evolved more to the, the practice of mindfulness. of just throughout the day, just becoming aware of what I'm doing. And that takes you out of all the drama that you get caught up in your head, where you know, our emotions and everything else takes us away. We start getting really worked up. The sympathetic nervous system gets fired up and all the stress hormones are going through. But if you just pause and just take a breath and just notice what's actually happening, all that starts coming down again. So for me, mindfulness is just living meditation. It's good to sit 20 minutes. I still do my morning practice. But really the practice is throughout the day. You do that practice on your cushion or on your mat so that during the rest of your life, these skills are available to you. So you might find yourself getting worked up over some, something, somebody yelled at you, you have a family problem, a relationship issue, something at work's not going well, and you feel it, you're getting tense, your breath is changing, and then just remember, huh, be mindful. What does anger feel like? You don't try to stop it, that's just gonna make it worse. And you don't act on it, that makes it worse too. Those are both yang attitudes to anger. You act out on it or you try to stop it. The yin attitude is just to notice it. Anger, my old friend, welcome back. I haven't seen you for at least a week. And you just notice what anger feels like. And then suddenly just by watching it, things slow down. Well, the yin yoga practice is exactly that. When you're in the pose, you've got all these sensations coming up. It's a beautiful chance to develop your mindfulness. What am I feeling? What is this? Where is it? Am I too deep? Am I not deep enough? 
and you'll notice that it changed. First I felt in my back, now I feel in the inner legs. So you just become aware of it. So for the people who don't have time to meditate, your yin yoga can be your meditation because you get these five minute little meditation periods where you can pay attention. What are you feeling? Yeah, so beautiful. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Bernie, do you want to share with us what you do yourself to stay healthy? What does <laughs> your daily practice look like? Well, it changes throughout life. Now, I'm 65 now, so what I do now isn't what I did at 55 or 45. For me, physical health has three components, They're kind of like orthogonal axes. There's endurance, strength, and mobility. I will run sprints and do stair climbers to get my endurance up, to work the heart. I will swing kettlebells and do push-ups and handstands to build, build physical strength. And then I'll work on my yin yoga practice to build mobility. So I work through all three of these. One day I'll work on endurance. Next day I'll work on strength, swing kettlebells. Next day I'll work on mobility. And then I'll repeat that. And on the seventh day, usually I take the day off. Now I do meditation before all of those. So even on the seventh day, I'll still meditate. But I try to have those sort of cycle through. That, that's kind of the idealized life gets in the way. Sometimes you don't do it. And sometimes I'll add my yin at the end of my running or I'll add yin at the end of my strength building. It just won't be as long. So you can kind of combine some of these. To me, it's all yoga. Yoga isn't so much what you do. Yoga is how you do what you do. So you can be mindful while you're lifting weights. You can be mindful when you're out running or climbing stairs. And certainly you can be mindful when you're doing your yin practice. So all of this could be yogic. Yoga is not just what you do on the mat. And yoga is not just postures. So that's kind of what I've evolved into today. In 10 years, I'm maybe something completely different. But beyond that, there's a whole lifestyle. Basically, health is three components in general as well. There's, there's lifestyle, there's diet, <clears throat> and there's um, basically your stress levels. Uh, lifestyle is what you do at work and what you're doing during your um, free time. Diet, of course, is what you're eating. And then the rest of it is just kind of like, well, exercise. So that's the three that you need. Watch your diet, watch your lifestyle, watch your exercise. If you get those in balance, I think health will kind of take care of itself. Yeah, that, that's awesome that you do that with, um, with being 65. A lot of people I know who are 65, they don't really do anything anymore because they say, I'm getting old and I'm not into sports anymore. And you can really see how their bodies deteriorate um, and atrophy. Yeah. Well, that, I think we got it backwards. I think one of the reasons that we retire when we're older is because it takes more time to be healthy. We have to work at it more. I'm sure you remember when you were 19, 20, 25, if you stayed out all night at a party, you could get up the next morning, go to work, you're feeling a little bit tired. But you bounce back pretty quickly. You're young. But once you hit your 30s, you're noticing, I'm not bouncing back quite as fast. Well, wait till your 50s. And then your 60s, you don't bounce back at all. So the older you get, the more you have to work at being healthy. You're going to have to spend more time doing it. Well, but also the older you get, the more time you have to do it because you're not caught up in the career anymore. Your children have grown. So you've got this extra time in your hand. Why not spend it on being healthy? You don't really need to watch that soap opera today. <laughs> you can get off Facebook for half an hour. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. <laughs> And I'm also amazed by the depth um, of um, what you write in your books. And you must be so focused to do all that research and um, write such amazing books. Is that also your secret to stay so focused when you do your writings? I think that's just passion. <clears throat> I find it fascinating. I love to learn about these things. I've always liked learning. And I always found one of the best ways to learn something is to try to teach it. Now, my, my science degree is in physics, not in biology or anatomy. So to be able to write these things, I have to study a lot. So it's like I'm giving myself a university course in anatomy as I write these books. So it's my way to learn. And it's one thing just to read it, oh, that's interesting. But if I have to actually write it for others, I have to learn a lot more about it. Sometimes I'll write a paragraph and I'll write one sentence and I think, well, how do I know that's true? I heard that somewhere. And the rest of the day I'm researching so that I can actually footnote why I thought that was true. So I only wrote one paragraph all day, but I spent you know, six hours doing research. So to me, that's, that's passion. But it's not so much that I really need to write a book. It's writing the book really helps me learn. 
and I enjoy sharing what I find fascinating. Mm. Yeah, that's that's easy to tell when you read um, when somebody reads your books. It 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 is so clear that um, the passion that's in there you can totally feel it. <laughs> yeah. Same with your books. You've written what seven books? It's the same thing. You've got this passion. You have this knowledge. You want to share it, and that's what gives you the energy to do it. Yeah, I feel the same way. Thank you for yeah. sharing that, Bernie. Is there anything else you want to share with us? <clears throat> I think my yoga practice is evolved to these two things. Have an intention, pay attention. An intention is like, why are you doing the pose? Why are you doing your practice today? And having that intention will give you the strength to pay attention when your mind wanders. Remember why you're doing this. But paying attention gets you to maybe change your intention. Like you may, I'm trying to go here, but I'm actually over here. And if I wasn't paying attention, I'd be completely lost. So like in life and in yoga, have an intention and then pay attention. Are you on track? And you're always free to change your intention. You know, life changes. Your intention today may not be the same as tomorrow. But if you're not paying attention, then you're always going to end up lost and not get what you want out of your practice. Mm. Yeah, so inspirational. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. So, Bernie, if, if people want to get in touch with you or learn from you, where can they find you? The best bet is uh, on my website, yinyoga.com. There is a forum there where people can ask questions. Uh, some people try to get a hold of me through email or Facebook. Facebook's very unreliable because I'm not always on there, and I sometimes find questions on there from like six months ago, and I think, oh, these poor people think I've been ignoring them. But if you go to my forum on yinyoga.com, I'll always respond to those very quickly. So and in there is a list of all my books, my trainings, my videos. So everything I've ever done is listed there and they can get a hold of me through that. Yeah, awesome. Bernie, thank you so, so very much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. My pleasure. Thank you, Stephanie, for inviting me. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs> you do too. Thank you. Bye-bye and blessings, everybody.